and that's back at Lockheed in the days I was there when the mechanics class built this uh, the Corbin Baby Ace little home built airplane. They did it just for a training project in a mechanics class at Lockheed and the, the instructor had decided to give him something to shoot for so he let him start working on his airplane. They, they did so good he decided to see how you finish the airplane so they got it finished and then the instructor called on my friend JB that I mentioned several times. He was then working at Lockheed down the flight line. They called him and asked him to come and check the work. And it's a good thing he did because he found a lot of well joints that were not satisfactory and I don't know what else, but he, he worked it over and got it where it was safe to fly. That's all they wanted, just a demo that the class had completed. So nobody never told anybody that JB had it. They didn't mention that. They said that class built this airplane just for publicity for Lockheed mm -hmm. and that class. Anyhow, they had a big opening day uh, first fly celebration for that mechanics class airplane. And that's the day that this particular C-5, which happened to be ship 10 in the production line, was in, in progress in, in flight operations. And they, I was supposed to fly this airplane that day. It was going to be released that Saturday. But they wanted this thing that Saturday morning. They sent out invitations to the public and everything. So I, I went up on the hill where they had the crowd in this airplane and took part in their speeches and then got in this airplane and flew it around the pattern once and landed, gave it back to the crowd and came around in and got back to the C-5 which had been released by then, flew this Ship 10 for a production flight that day too. Didn't buy it that day. I think it had to have two more flights. When you flew the Corbin Baby Ace, you were test flying it then? Yeah, it was. It was his first flight. It was supposed to be the first flight, but it truly wasn't. JB had, you have to see Lockheed and other east west runway, big runways here, and the cross runway, north south here. And down here is about 4,000 feet of the cross runway, and it's just hangars along there for working on different airplanes and that sort of thing. But it's a runway there. But Lockheed put all the buildings down there, but JB put the airplane down there and worked on it, and he got down on the end of that runway that night late, and took off and flew down that runway a couple of times, taxied back and flew it down again just to be mm -hmm. sure it was all right. So he had had it had in the air. He didn't go very far. He just got up 10 feet and yeah. landed again. So he had actually flown before that. So the CG was more or less checked out. He, well, JB didn't have any concern with that. He just wanted to see it held together. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't mention that to me and he should have because it was CG was really off. Was it? Yeah. I flew around the pattern with a stick all the way to the left, not all the way to the left, quite left, and full, almost full forward. Uh -huh. I was in doubt about having enough. I was afraid the tail was going to sink back. Kept the power on. I landed with cruise power, got it on the wheels, and then pulled the power back, the tail just came. So you did a t wheel landing, huh? What yeah. did that have, an A40? Yeah. No, wait a minute, I don't think so. Originally it had an A40, I'm sure, yeah. but uh, and they had an A65. Oh, wow. That was about the lowest powered. I'm surprised it would be uh, tail heavy then with a bigger well, engine. Yeah, they must have thought it was going to be nose heavy, so they moved it way back deliberately. They probably uh -huh. had something in the back there, I don't know what. Hmm. But it was real tail heavy. But it flew okay. And I saw it years later over in Cedartown, Georgia. I don't know how I got from the Civil. They gave it, Lockheed gave it to the Civil Air Patrol, and they moved it around different Civil Air Patrol units for a long time, years. If now, is that it. about the, is, was that Volkswagen VR1 smaller than that or about yes. the same? Smaller. Smaller. Yeah. It had a half a, a VW engine, which is, VW engine is only 40 horsepower to start with, so I think that'd be 20 horsepower for it, and it flew great. That VR1 not, must not have been much bigger than the 50 percent that Chris is working on. <laughs> not much. It had, it had a lot more wing, and the wing is yeah. pretty big. It was it looked like a British airplane. It had a turned up tip wing, and the fuselage was pretty small. And it was two place. It had two seats. I didn't. I just flew it by myself. Mm -hmm. anyway, I wouldn't have tried to get off very in a very small field with two people in it. But they had plenty of power for them. Okay, let's go to the next. I think I'm running out of battery here. That oh, that's the same one. That. Yeah. that shows the 65. What, who's the, what's the story with the lady? Oh, she was the Miss Georgia of that year. Okay. And they were they called on her to get good publicity. 
the news pictures for Lockheed. Yeah. The publicity department always looking for corners to get something in the paper, you know. Yeah, that engine's got valve covers, so it was a 65. Uh huh. That's right. That was a 65, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. See the carburetor drop right here. Yeah. Because if it was a 40, it would have been flathead. That's, That's just the, the article. Yeah. Lockheed Magazine story. Yeah. And there's one of my rocket champions from Park Airfield. And painted on the side there. Yeah. Painted over the lock the champ paint job. I like that, but I, today I like the regular paint job better. Yeah. I got most uh, between that Jet Star, I've got eight thousand hours in Jet Stars, and I've got over eight thousand in this this airplane or or its companions. Uh -huh. We had. Four of them at one time at, at Park Air painted just like that. Mm -hmm. And I sat in that back seat for a long time. <laughs> it's very for 8,000 hours. <laughs> yeah. A lot better than this. if you talk about Cubs and Champs, ain't no argument with me. Yeah. Champ is 100% better. Cubs are wonderful, but it ain't, ain't as good as a Champ. So, you, when the, could you even fly it from the front seat after being back there for oh, 8,000 yeah. hours? <laughs> you can fly me the seat, right? Quite well, it don't make a difference. Yeah, it's nice in the front. The only difference in front and back really is the length of the nose ahead of you to tell you swerve motions. Yeah. And if tail dark the airplane, that's very important as you found out. Yeah. Well, the you visibility. Out that nose, that's the main thing. You're checking people out after flying tri gears where it's real steady on a runway and mm -hmm. get them to a tail wheel. When the tail wheel gets up, there's nothing to keep that nose from swiv swiveling that's right. on the main gear. So, the key to tail wheel flying is not the stall landing, but to keeping the nose straight. Mm -hmm. And that's just something you have to learn and abide by. It's like a, like a religion. You've got to have your, be conscious of that possible or any swerve sort of motion that takes place all the time. Smooth air, smooth runways is not likely to happen, but crosswinds and things, you really got to be on it. And now there's another park airplane, that's a super cruiser, the same paint job. And then Lockheed still, this is a Lockheed 18 Lodestar, Lockheed airplane, so they bought one to fly for their executive transport. Okay. Most of their trips were either to Washington for, for politics or to uh, Dayton, Tennessee for Air Force dealings. And you flew that? Yeah. We, we had Lockheed, uh, many of us took turns of a year each flying that for oh, the company. I see. Not, not all the Lockheed pilots. A lot of them would not check out in it and didn't want to. Hmm. But there were three or four, myself included, that loved to fly it. So I did fly it for you. It was a good old airplane. It crews about 220. Yeah. And then that's, that's your fleet. Fleet biplane. With the big tires. Big air tires, that's right. Those particular tires I had to have manufactured by Goodyear. We could not find any on the market anywhere of that size. And called Goodyear, and the guy said, as a matter of fact, We've still got the molds for those tires. Not only those, we get the mold for every tire Goodyear's ever made. Hmm. We can make here another one. The only catch was they didn't want to do it just two. They had to buy four, which hmm. suited me. That wasn't too many. Yeah. So they got the molds out and made four tires for me. Now that plane had a oversized engine, didn't it? Yes, very much oversized. The original had a 90 Kenner, and this is a 220 Continental engine. That's considerable more power. It's and the fleet's pretty light plane to begin with, isn't it? Very light, yeah. About half size steerman. Yeah. So that thing must have just climbed like a rocket. Well, it made a very good tow plane. That's what we made it for. Oh. It had a tow hitch on the back here. Yeah. And a release in the cockpit. Most tow planes, not most I guess, but lots of tow planes just got a release back there and a release cable run up the outside of the fuselage and in the cockpit window. You hold on to it. 
No kidding. Yeah. Just hanging out. But you don't care. But this one had a nice inside release in the cockpit. Custom made. There's a side view of it. Yeah. Did that one fly pretty nice? Oh, just beautiful. I like to tell the story there because when we put that big engine on, we anticipated that a big change in horsepower and weight would cause lots of problems. So we tried to get it all planned out ahead of it, like you were talking about the Corbin, didn't they do? But uh, we did right here. We got the CG perfect the first time. Didn't require any change. When you put a bigger engine on that, do you put more down thrust in? That's what I was going to say. We also had to build the first bay from here, from this hump forward. It had to be totally cut off and rebuilt to accommodate to fit the engine itself, the engine mount. And so we rebuilt that, and as we did it, we planned it to put the thrust line down thrust and right thrust, just like a model airplane. Exactly. And the first time I flew this thing, Greg's runway, I just lighted up on the runway, took my feet off the rudder, pushed the throttle up, and it went straight ahead. Beautiful. Didn't budge. Huh. Just straight ahead. That was just right for a fleet because the lifting tail and the lifting stab on the fleet has got a curved surface on the side, on this side of the stab, and on the top of the fin of the, of the horizontal stabilizer. And those function by lifting, as lifting forces, so that the once you set the trim, you can trim this stab up and down, but once you set it in flight, it stays set forever. It never needs changing. Oh, you have to manually do it on the ground? Is it a no, screw trim? It had a, had a cable run up here around pulling and it had a handle. You could roll back and forth to set the trim, but I'm saying you never want to cause that lifting stab to stab the characteristic was you never needed to do that once you set it. It was, it was right, yeah, it could be adjusted on the ground also with a post there. Was it a screw trim? Was it what? A screw type trim? The, you know, the, no, no, it's just a pulley. Pulley, okay. With a cable running around a pulley up here and a pulley back here. Yeah, but wouldn't that turn the screw, uh, turn a screw that no, didn't work that way? That's huh? a jack screw device, and that didn't have like a cub, it didn't have that. Okay. That cable was fastened to a bell crank, like this. No, like this. Oh, bell crank. Here's the stab, and here's the uh -huh. transfer of this motion to this motion. Okay. Simple. More like a radio RC airplane would do. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. And very effective, very practical. What a wonderful airplane that was. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, you're grinning pretty good there. Yeah. Oh, boy. What happened to it? Uh, I sold it to another RCer over in Mississippi, Doc Edwards. Yeah. And he's, he flew it for many years. I don't know how many, but at least 20 or 25 years. He oh, wow. It. He flew it. It's very, had very few hands in on it. Very. Well, I don't know how many since then, but... Yeah. Well, um, you know, I was talking, actually, when I was having lunch with uh, Noel, we were talking about, he was said he loved, how much he loves biplanes and wanted to get one, and, and we were talking about reproduction wacos, and I says, you know, I, I always wonder why they somebody didn't reproduce, make a reproduction fleet. It looks like, I mean, it's a lighter plane, and it's very... Uh, I suppose spread. they pulled all the antique people and... Got more votes for a more modern airplane, yeah. so Waco certainly is. Yeah. And bigger, too. The fleet is strictly a one pilot, one passenger airplane. The Waco is a three place airplane, you know. Yeah. But I don't know if the fleet could, it's probably too heavy to qualify. I, a cut down like a three quarter size fleet may even be fit into the sport category. It would have to be smaller than that. Yeah. Biplanes are always heavier than right, two planes. Yeah. So here you are flying in which it's, one of those? I wasn't in any of them. Oh. I was just a... Uh, but you flew those, didn't you? Yeah, I flew all of them. Those are the airplanes types, some of the airplane types. I think we had 13 different types of airplanes at Atlantic City when I was in the Korean, during the Korean War, and that's just four of those airplanes. Okay. Including the Cutlass and all those strange planes. Yeah, it's not in there, see. Yeah. There's an AD in the back and a F9F. A Cougar there, and a Panther. And a Banshee here and a T, T2V there. 2V? Not T2V. That's it's what the Navy version is. Oh, of a T33. Okay. My friend Eric Jackson tried to jettison the tanks on one one time. 
and one tank went, the other one didn't when it was full. So he had a full wing tank on one side and none on the other. And he had to maintain 230 knots to be with Aileron on that side, as slow as he could go without rolling over. So he tried, tried, he went to the Jettison area and flew around and everybody on the ground was talking to him about how to get rid of that tank and he tried and tried to shake the airplane, he couldn't get rid of it. And they told him to jump and he wouldn't do it. And he took it back to the base, which only had 5,000 feet. If he had the fuel, he should have gone to a longer runway. If he didn't have the fuel then, he'd flown too long. And he landed that thing at, at Navy Atlantic City. He told me at 225 indicated when it touched the ground. Good Lord. And he got it stopped at the end of the runway. It burned up the tires, the wheels and the brakes, but he got it stopped. Mm. It was... He was a mighty good pilot and very brave pilot and a good guy, but he sure wrecked a lot of airplanes. <laughs> he landed an F-8 wheels up one time, and it stopped with the, its four-blade prop, it stopped with two blades down, yeah. and the tail skid on the ground and didn't touch the wingtips. <laughs> Three-point landing. He <laughs> uh, landed a cutlass and with the gear up and slammed it down the nose and broke broke his back, which was expected. Wow. And he was smart enough to to know that and sit tight, didn't try to get out. And wait until they got the cherry pick the big crane with a seat yeah. on it, came out there and got him up and lifted him into that and carried him to the hospital. I said Doc told him maybe if he'd have tried to walk he'd have cut his spinal cord and killed him. But he was back flying in about six months after that. Wow. And Doc told him he'd never fly again. He said, I will too. <laughs> he said the doc told him he's the guy that did the blind landing in, in World War II. Oh. No, Korea. In Korea. The same And the guy. doc at that time told him he would never fly again. He said, you watch. He was back on flying duty in a couple of months. That time. The same guy that got his eyes cut up. Wow. He was always doing things. He, did he, that guy ever write a book or anything? No. Hmm. No. They made that movie, but it wasn't a good movie because it told Made yeah. the other guy the hero, not him. Yeah. He didn't mention me. his name anyhow. Mentioned Van Johnson, so I didn't like the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Ed was a, you just have to know him. He was a cheerful, he was short. He was probably five, three or four. Wow. But 220 or 30 pounds, all muscle. He grew, grew up in Augusta, Georgia on the back streets. And he'd take on anybody if he just crossed, looked at him cross out for a second. He was, he was jumping, looking for trouble all the time. Huh. He would, when we lived in Atlantic City, when I moved up there, he was already there, and we got a, an apartment in this apartment complex, which was right across the hall from his door and our door, just like that. And so we became pretty good friends there, being close, and we got, got along good, but frequently Ed, and his wife Grace were over in our place and Ed would get me and push me down on the floor and grab my arms or legs or something, twist me in a pretzel or something. Yeah. He'd start twisting and pushing, I'd start hollering and the, my kids would start hollering and, and Jean would come screaming in the kitchen and say, what are you doing? <laughs> and she would make him turn loose. But he wouldn't do it till, till she got on him. <laughs> but I liked him okay. <laughs> I think I told you, then about one rainy winter night there, went out to the apartment, out to the parking lot behind the apartments to get my car and I walked up and down and I couldn't find my car. It was a Jeep station wagon from the 1950s, you remember them? Mm -hmm. And uh, walked and walked up and down. Finally it turned out that Ed's wife was watching through the kitchen window and she got Ed out of bed and said, you go out there and tell him where his car is. <laughs> he had taken that car and pulled it or moved it, he picked up the back end so he could move it apparently out of the parking place and he had it all the way out on the street. Oh my gosh. And, and he either pushed it or carried it or rolled it, I don't know how he did it, but he did it. <laughs> just to be funny. Sounds like a character. Well, we're out of battery, uh, uh -oh. Oh, Jack. We'll have to come back here. That's not a sun and fun. Just a good J5. I love him. So I had to take that picture. That's a T-50 I had, but don't, that's not it. That was a real nice one there. And there's John Apache up at his hangar in Carsville. John Carlevic. 
and there's my old Apache after we put the back windows in. Yeah. That's got a couple mods on it, doesn't it? You did the windows and did not, you do that? Here. In this picture only the windows, but later when we had it painted dorsal between, fin. they put the dorsal in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was my five thousand dollar airplane at the time. <laughs> well let's leave it there and we'll come back and talk about that one some more. Okay.